Hello there, thanks for watching and I appreciate you. This is a video in a series of videos showing you how to make a custom character controller that uses rigid body physics, sim machine cameras, Unity's new input system, and custom player gravity. In the last video, we created a moving and rotating platform and made it so that any rigid body that is on top of the platform will also move and rotate along with the platform. In this video, we're going to add the ability for our player to manipulate other rigid bodies by attracting and repelling them. It's actually quite fun to mess with, so let's get started. Just a reminder, this project is exactly how we left it in the last video of this series. And just like in the last video, I'm going to treat this video as being a little more advanced. That means I'm going to skip over the simpler things and assume that at this point you've been following along the series and are familiar with Unity and my methods. If you have not watched this series yet, I would strongly encourage you to do so. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments below. I do try to reply to everyone that comments. And finally, we also now have a community Discord server. The link to join that is in the video description below. Alright, as usual, we have new input to add, so let's start with adding our new input actions. So down the project panel, scripts, input, input actions. In the action section, we're going to be adding three new inputs here. I'm just going to go ahead and add them, and then we'll come back and we'll review them real quick. Okay, so the first one we call to activate, we set its action type to value and its control type to any. For the bindings on the gamepad, we're using the right trigger, and for the mouse, we're using the left button. Next one we call it on off. For its action type, we set the button. And for its bindings, we're using the gamepad's button north and our keyboard's E key. And the third and final new input that we added is called mode. We also set its action type to button. And for its bindings, we're using the right shoulder on the gamepad and the F key on the keyboard. Okay, don't forget to save your asset. And with that, we're done in the input actions. We can go ahead and close this. Now we have our new input action set up. We need to add our input actions to our primary input handler script, which is our humanoid land input script. So once again, down our project panel, let's go ahead and let's open up our humanoid land input script in our editor of choice. And now that we're here, I'll go ahead and make changes that we need to make and we'll recap right after. Okay, so at the very top, we added our public variables. The first one we called activate input. Next one's called on off was pressed to this frame. And the third one we called mode was pressed to this frame. If we scroll down to our on enable function here, you can see that we subscribe to our performed and canceled events for our activate input action. And also in our on disable function, we unsubscribe from the same input action. Next, if we scroll down to our update function, just like with our change cameras pressed this frame, we're also going to check to see if our on off and mode buttons were pressed to this frame. So we added these two lines right here. And finally, if we scroll all the way down, we have our set activate function or event listener. And here we're saying our public float activate input equals the context of our input and we're just grabbing the float value from it. Okay, so that's it here. Let's jump back over to Unity and let's keep going. Okay, I'm back in Unity now. I'm gonna go ahead and down on the project panel, miscellaneous folder, we're gonna create a couple new scripts here. All right, we create our two new scripts. One's called manipulator and the other one's called on-screen counter. I went ahead and copy and pasted them over for now, don't worry. We'll go back and we will review them line by line in just a minute. But first we need to go ahead and set up some new game objects. So let's get that done. We're gonna do something new here. We're gonna use Text Mesh Pro. If you haven't used that before, I can't remember if it's included with Unity or not. I'm pretty sure it is, so you shouldn't need to do this, but just in case, in Unity, if you go to Window, Package Manager, make sure you have the Text Mesh Pro package installed. All right, let's close that back out. In the hierarchy panel, let's right click in the middle of nowhere. And we're gonna create under UI a new canvas. We can just leave that and call it canvas, that's fine. And under canvas, we're gonna right click and create under UI a new text, text mesh pro. And we're gonna call it collected boxes counter. Now, if this is the first time using text mesh pro within your project, then you're gonna be greeted with this window here. You can go ahead and click import TMP essentials. And once that's done, you can go ahead and just close the window. And now all we need to do here is change the location of the text. So in our inspector panel, our position X, we're gonna change that to negative 750. And our position Y, we're gonna change that to negative 400. Additionally, we're gonna give our text a little bit more room. So we're gonna change our width to 350 and our height can stay at 50. All the other values can stay their default values. That's fine for now. If you want, you can also change wrapping. Actually, let's do that. Let's just change wrapping to disabled and that should be good for now. That takes care of our counter, so now let's set up our actual manipulator object. In the hierarchy panel, under player, humanoid, red, player, under camera follow, we're going to create a new cylinder. And we call it manipulator. 
We're going to create one more cylinder and we're going to call it laser. In the hierarchy panel, we're going to select our manipulator cylinder. And with the manipulator cylinder selected, in our inspector panel, we're going to change its position. We're going to set its x to 1, its y to negative 0.3, and its z to 0.75. We're also going to change its rotation along the x-axis to negative 90. And for its scale, we're going to change its x to 0.2, its y to 0.3, and its z to 0.2. Under the capsule collider component, we're going to go ahead and we're going to set the radius to 0.6 its height to 3, and make sure that the direction is along the Y axis. Next, we're going to add another capsule collider. This capsule collider we're going to set as a trigger, so we're going to make sure we check the box. The center, we're going to change the Y to negative 52, and we're going to set the height to 100. In the scene panel, you can kind of see what that's done here. That's set a trigger collider way out in front of the direction that our manipulator is pointing. Just wanted to show you that, but now that you've seen it, let's go ahead and let's change the radius to 0.05. And last to our manipulator game object, in the inspector panel, we're going to add in our component and we're going to add a rigid body. And under the rigid body, all we're going to do here is uncheck use gravity and check is kinematic. Okay, and last but not least, in our hierarchy panel, let's select our laser game object. It's a cylinder. And now that we have the collider going out in front of our manipulator, we need to have a visual representation so we can see where we're actually pointing our manipulator. So once again, with our laser game object selected in our hierarchy panel, let's go over to the inspector panel. We're going to set the position, the X to 1, the Y to negative 0.3, and the Z to 51. Once again, the rotation, the X, we're going to set that to negative 90. And for the scale, we're going to set the X to 0.01 the y to 50, and the z to 0 0.01. Next, before I forget, this is very important, we need to make sure that from this game object, our laser game object, we remove the capsule collider that's there by default. So go ahead and right click remove. And under our mesh renderer, let's go ahead and let's turn off cast shadows. We don't need this to cast a shadow. This is a laser. If anything, it's going to illuminate. And we can also uncheck receive shadows. All right, down in our project panel, let's go to materials, and we're going to create a new material. I'm going to call it laser. For our laser, we're just going to make a classic red laser. So for the albedo, let's just go ahead and let's set that to red. You can double click. And here we're going to check emission. We're also going to change that to red. And that's it. Now we need to make sure that we apply this to our actual laser game object. So with the laser game object selected in the hierarchy panel, we can go over to the inspector panel. Under the mesh render component, we can drop down materials and we can choose the little dot over here. And in this panel that pops up, we can double click the laser material that we just created. Okay, we just have a little bit more legwork to do. If you look down at the bottom of the window, you'll actually see that we have an error already. And down in our project panel area, if we click on the console tab, we can then double click the actual error. And in our hierarchy panel, it went ahead and selected our event system game object. And in our inspector panel, you'll see that we have an error here. You are using standalone input module, which uses the old input manager, blah, 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 replaced with input system UI input module. So we're going to go ahead and just click that button. And that's done. That's all we had to do there. I'm going to go back over to the project tab now. And under asset scripts, I'm going to go back to our MISC folder that contains our manipulator and on-screen counter scripts. Up in the hierarchy panel, I'm going to select our manipulator. And then I'm going to drag and drop our manipulator script from our project panel to our inspector panel to add the script to the object. And back in our hierarchy panel, we're going to select our collected boxes counter. And to this object, we're going to attach our on-screen counter script. Under the on-screen counter script, we need to make sure that we assign an item counter. And go ahead and just click the bullet here and double click collected boxes counter. Back in the hierarchy panel, select our manipulator again. Now we can finish setting up our manipulator script that we added here. For input, we can hit the bullet and we can add our input handler. For the counter, click the bullet, and now we can choose our collected boxes counter. And finally, we are all set to do our play test. Okay, I just did a play test, and there is a bug we need to fix real quick. This goes all the way back to when I first started this series, and when we set up our player game object hierarchy. The camera follow should not be a child of our player game object. It should be a child of our red game object. Believe it or not, this does cause problems with our colliders. So let's go ahead and let's move that now. Again, we're just going to take our camera follow object and make it a child of our red game object rather than our player game object. All right, with that done, we are now finally ready for a play test. And here we are in our game now. You see our player has his manipulator to the side of him and is projecting a laser in the direction that it is aimed. So if we go back to our regular third person mode, and if I aim at some cubes and I activate it, you can see that we start to pull them towards me. 
I can also change the mode. Instead, I can push them. And I also have the option to leave it on permanently so I don't have to hold the trigger button. I'm using my gamepad right now because the mouse is a little tricky to use at this point because we haven't hidden the cursor yet. But also if I change the game mode back to attract and I can just pick up the cubes and you'll see down in the bottom left corner we have a boxes collected and a number that is just counting how many boxes we have picked up. It's a very very simple sort of inventory system basically. And a cool thing about this too is that I set it up so we can use the right trigger on a gamepad and depending on how much you pull the trigger will vary the amount of force that we're using to attract or repel the object. So yeah, that's what it does. Let's go look at the code now and we'll go through it line by line to see how it works. And now we're looking at our on-screen counter script. At the very top, make sure you include using TM Pro. And as for our variables, we have a public, it's our text mesh pro UGUI. And we're calling it item counter. This is just basically our text that we're adding to our screen in our UI. And then we just have one more variable. It's another public variable. It's an integer. We're calling it counter and we're allowing it to be set anywhere, which is not necessarily a great idea. Usually you'd want to just handle this locally within the script. But anyway, in our update function, every frame, we're setting the text of our item counter to be boxes collected and then the number of our counter. So it's a very simple script. Let's move on to our manipulator script. This one's a bit more complicated. All right, now before we dive into the script, I just want to explain that this script was originally used for a completely different purpose. At the time, I was building my own solar system and I was playing with planetary gravity. And I was trying to make it somewhat realistic, so you're going to see some references to planets and some other things that we'll touch base on. But anyway, that's what this script was originally used for, and that's what you could use the script for if you wanted. There's a lot of different applications for this. And with all that said, let's get right into it. First off, as usual, we have our variable declarations. The first being a constant float called gravitational constant and its value is 0 0.667408. Now if you don't know what a gravitational constant is, here's some information right here for you. And this ties into the whole planetary gravity thing obviously. Next we're passing in our input as well as our on-screen counter. We're going to cache our mesh renderer component. Then we're creating a private list of rigid bodies called attractees. And then we have three booleans which are going to help keep track of our input. Let's scroll down a little bit. In our awake function, we're getting our mesh renderer component and caching it within our mesh renderer variable. This next line, set color, we actually don't need that there. We can remove that. That was an old relic from before we were calling set color in our update function. Speaking of our update function, in our update function, the first line, if input on off was pressed this frame, then we're going to call our on off function, which is also unnecessary since our on off function just below our update function here is just one line. We could just simply include this one line of code in here since it's also only being referenced once, but it's fine. We'll just leave it. Next, if input.mode was pressed this frame, we're going to call the change mode function. Also, change mode function is only referenced once. It's one line of code. We don't need to make this entire function. We could just include this right inside the if statement. And in the next line, we're setting our manipulator toggled on variable to equal whether or not our input.active input is greater than zero. And finally, in our update function, we're calling our set color function. So these on, off, and change mode functions are very simple. We're just setting our variables to not equal whatever they currently are. So that when you press the key, they will just toggle back and forth between on and off. So it's really very simple. Next, we're going to scroll down just a little bit further. We have our set color function. We have a comment here that if we are attracting, then the color of our manipulator is going to be blue. Otherwise, the color is going to be red. So there's just some pretty simple if checks here. If manipulator is enabled or manipulator toggled on, then we're going to check to see if our manipulator's mode is toggled on or off. Depending upon that, then the color of our mesh renderer attached to our manipulator is either going to be red, else it's going to be blue. Next, I spot another issue here, else if manipulator toggled or manipulator toggled on. I have no idea why this manipulator toggled on is here. It does not need to be here. Probably just another old relic. This is what I get for not reviewing the code before actually recording. Anyway, else if our manipulator is not active, basically, then we're going to check to see if our manipulator mode is toggled or not. If it's toggled on, then we're going to change the color to white and red. Otherwise, we're going to change the color to white and blue. We're going to scroll down to our fix update function. In our fix update function, we're just doing a for each function for each of our rigid bodies within our list of attractees. When I was using this for planetary gravity, I was having problems with the object itself being added to the list. So I added this if statement to make sure that this attractee does not equal this or itself. And if that's the case, then we're going to go ahead and execute our attract function and pass in our rigid body attractee. Next, we're going to look at that attract function that we're passing the rigid body into. 
First, we have an if check, check and see if our mic layer is enabled or if our mic layer is toggled on. This actually shouldn't be here. This should actually be in the fix update function and it should contain our for each loop so that our for each loop is not executed unnecessarily. Anyway, it's a little optimization. Again, this is old code, whatever, let's keep moving, this works. But if our manipulator is enabled or manipulator toggled on, then we we'll create a vector three called direction. And our direction is gonna equal our transform.position minus our RB to attract.position. Next, we're gonna create a float called distance because we want a distance value between our manipulator and the object that we're attracting. And we're gonna say that that equals the magnitude of our direction. This next if statement is also a relic of planetary gravity. Again, I was having problems with large objects and this is a little bit of dirty code. I really don't like returning nothing in the middle of code to exit the function. I think that's kind of dirty and I don't normally do it, but this is kind of debug code. We don't really need to include this, but I'm gonna leave it here for now anyway, because it's here already. But if distance equals zero, so if there's no distance, obviously this should be a minimum threshold of like one or whatever you want it to be, or even just a less than or equal to zero then we're going to return nothing and exit the function. Which means if you're not familiar, any code within this function after this return, so all of this down here, will not be executed. Anyway, assuming the distance is not equal to zero, then we're going to create a float called force magnitude, and we're going to set its initial value to zero. If our input.active input is greater than zero, which is our analog stick, our trigger on our gamepad, if our gamepad is creating a value greater than zero, which it's going to report anything from between zero to one, then our force magnitude is going to equal our gravitational constant times a modifier of 750 times our RB to attracts mass divided by the distance between them times our input to activate input. So the parentheses here aren't really necessary. We can ignore them. They're probably also just a relic from when I was messing around with this. But anyway, we're taking our gravitational constant, multiplying it by multiplier, taking into consideration our object's mass, because in this case, we want them all to move equal regardless of their mass. Divided by our distance, we want to take into account the distance. The closer they are, the stronger the force will be. Otherwise, if they're further away, then the lesser the force will be. And then we want to multiply it by our input.activate input, which I just mentioned is going to be a value between 0 and 1. So it's basically going to be a percentage. If we're only pulling the trigger halfway, it's going to be 0.5, which means we'll get half the total value, which means we'll get half our force. Otherwise, if input.activate input is not greater than 0, so we're not using our trigger analog stick, so our value is going to be 0 or 1, then we just don't want to use our input.activate input. There are obviously better ways to write this code. I'm not gonna change it at this point, but if you wanna go ahead and optimize it, make it a little cleaner, by all means go for it. It could definitely use it. Anyway, moving on, next we have a vector three called force, and we're saying it equals our direction normalized times our force magnitude. And I would like to go into more detail right now, but I really don't have the time. I'm just trying to get through the script. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and ask them in the comments below. And finally, we have one more if check, check in the C. If our manipulator mode is toggled, then our RB to attract dot add force is going to be a negative force. Otherwise, if it is not toggled, then our RB to attract dot add force is just going to be our calculated force. Finally, if we scroll just a little bit further, we have our trigger functions, which I've already previously explained in the last video in this series. This is what that thumbnail looks like here. So I'm just going to brush over this real quick. If not other dot attach rigid body equals null and not other dot attach rigid body is kinematic, then we're going to check to see if not attractees contains our rigid body already, then we're going to add this rigid body to our attractees list. Next, this is a new function. We have on trigger stay. So before we've just been using on trigger enter and on trigger exit, but if it stays, then we want to make sure that we are applying our force. So if our list contains the rigid body that we are trying to attract. Next, if our manipulator is enabled or our manipulator is toggled on, then we're going to go ahead and we want to turn off our use gravity on the rigid body. Otherwise, if we're not using our manipulator, then we're also going to check to see that the game object that we're modifying is not our player. This is actually getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, this is code that takes into account what we're going to do in our next video. But I apologize, a little sloppy. Maybe we will come back to this and I'll explain why this is here later. But for now, if it's not and it's not our player, player, then we want to go ahead and set back our use gravity to being true. Finally, we scroll a little bit further. We have our on trigger exit. Again, the same as in the last video. If not other dot attach rigid body equals null, then if attractees contains our rigid body, so we want to make sure that our rigid body is in the list, then we're going to go ahead and remove it from the list. And if the game object itself does not have the player tag, then we're going to go ahead and set use gravity back to true. Oh, I forgot about this one. We have one last function called on collision enter. This is basically triggered automatically by Unity whenever you have one collider collide with another collider. So our normal colliders, not the triggers. We have two different things. You have triggers and you have colliders. This is when one collider actually collides with another collider. So basically what this is saying, if we have something collide with our manipulator's collider, then this code's gonna be executed. If our manipulator is enabled or our manipulator's toggled on, 
and our Atraxes contains the ridge body that we just collided with. And if this is not a player game object that we collided with, then we want to move the rigid body that we collided with from our list. We want to destroy the actual game object that we collided with, and then we're going to increase our counter by one. So that's it. I know we went over that pretty quick. I skipped a lot of stuff and this is pretty poor code, but I hope you still find it useful. Oh, I almost forgot to include this a little bit here, but to make a left click interaction even kind of sort of usable in Unity while playtesting, we need to hide and lock our cursor. Well, really, we just need to lock it, but hiding is a nice bonus too. But anyway, let's just start to set up our game manager real quick. So in our hierarchy panel, we're just going to create a new empty game object. And we're going to call it game manager. And then down our project panel, let's go to scripts, misc, and let's create a new script here. We're going to call it game manager. We'll open this in our editor. And for now, in our start function, all we need to add are those two lines. As I mentioned before, all this is going to do is going to take our cursor and it's going to lock our cursor to the center of the screen. And then we're also going to take our cursor and we're going to make it invisible. So if we save this now, go back to Unity. And in Unity with our game manager game object selected, let's go ahead and add the script to it and save the project and we're all set. Now if we play the game, and if you click somewhere in the window, you'll see that my cursor disappeared. I can move anywhere and everything works just fine with the mouse and keyboard. I can left click without it interfering with anything else on any of my screens. And that's how you do it. Now to free your cursor, all you gotta do is on your keyboard, press the escape key and your cursor will reappear. Again, if you click back in the game window, it will hide and you're locked back in. And then you press escape again. So that's it for this video. I know I crammed a lot in this video and I just skimmed over it. Again, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below. We also have our Discord server. The link's in the description below. I'm really trying to wrap up this series. We only have two videos left after this one. In the next video, we're going to talk about physics in Unity and we're going to discuss update versus fix update. We're going to introduce a very simple game manager and we're going to add the ability to switch between characters. So for now, thanks for watching. I appreciate you and I'll see you in the next one. If you're feeling generous, leave a comment down below. I want to read what you're thinking. Let me know if you have any questions or recommendations. I'd also appreciate it very much if you liked the video. And if you're feeling extra, extra generous, it'd blow my mind if you subscribe to the channel. Being new to this and putting these videos together takes a lot of time and effort. Thank you for any and all participation and support. I look forward to continuing this in the next one. See ya.